Well, good evening. My name is Russ Matthews from City Bible Forum. I want to take a moment to welcome you to The Edge. If it's your first time coming to The Edge, we want to welcome you. For those of you who've been to The Edge event in the past, welcome back. For all of those overseas guests, thank you for coming along tonight or today, depending on where you are watching this event in the world. This year is a bit different. We will be doing these events live and also online in different cities throughout Australia. It's the same event you've come to know over the years, but with more of a local feel. Regardless of where the event is held, we hope you are able to engage with and enjoy tonight's discussion. Tonight, and every night at the Edge, whether it is live or online, it is short, sharp, and smart. Two speakers each have 15 minutes to share their wisdom and experience on a specific topic. Then you get to pose your questions to the panel short and sharp talks from two expert speakers on tonight's subject. We're going to be taking this topic to the edge. During the conversation, we may consider the bigger questions of life based on the subject spoken of by our speakers. Then by engaging with the speakers on the panel, we can consider the answers provided about this important subject. But really, the panel is your time to shine. Send in your questions throughout the talks at the edge. These details should have been sent to you prior to the event. We do have a question master here to be able to go through and take in your questions and send them to the panel through our moderator. Now, just a small reminder, could you make sure you put down where you're sending it from so that we're able to know who we're speaking to and what part of the earth we're actually sharing this event tonight? When we get to the panel discussion, our moderator will pose these questions to our speakers. Can I ask something of you, though? If you want your question to be considered, in the spirit of this event, could you make sure to keep these questions short, sharp, and respectful? Thank you for asking your questions at the edge. Tonight is short, sharp, and smart. The time is going to go by fast, and you will wish we had longer, I promise. I will come back after the panel discussion to share with you the next steps after tonight's discussion. But now, let's get to the event. Again, my name is Russ Matthews, and I'm going to hand this over to our moderator. Enjoy your time at The Edge. Thanks, Russ, and welcome to The Edge. We are coming to you live from Hobart, Tasmania, and we're so excited to know that there are people registered all around the country and even around the world. So we also have a live audience here tonight, which is absolutely excellent. And we would love to know where you are watching from. So send us a message. You can do this by clicking on the join inbox above your screen. Send us your country, your town, or even your office, wherever you're watching, let us know where you're from. It is here where you will also be sending in your questions tonight that I will be posing to the panel. So this is how you, the audience, can be part of The Edge. My name is Ella Hickey, and I'm your moderator for this evening. In amongst everything that is going on in the world right now, coronavirus, vaccine rollout, various protests, there's one topic that has just been in the forefront of the media, and that is climate change. After a while, you might find that this topic is just background noise, and that you can feel like there's not a whole lot that you, as an individual person, can do about it. But tonight at The Edge, we hope to remedy that. And we hope to be able to answer some of the questions that some of you may have. We also desire, most of all, to inject hope into the topic that is often seen in a dim light. Tonight's Edge speakers are here to inform us and to help us to consider what it means to reimagine hope in the light of climate change. 
So you can find all these details and more details about the event by going to the event booklet. This would have been sent to you before the event and you who are watching us online can see it up in the left corner. It says before the event and then you can click open and you can see the event booklet. So in the tradition of the edge, keeping things short, sharp and smart, I would like to dive straight in and introduce you to our first speaker, Matt King. Matt King is Professor of Polar Geodesy at the University of Tasmania. He's also Acting Head of the School of Geography, Planning and Spatial Sciences and will soon lead a new Australian Centre for Antarctic Science. He has published more than 130 papers in scientific literature, including many in the leading journal Science and Nature. A large part of his research has focused on ice sheet and sea level change and in 2012 he was part of an international team coordinated by NASA and the European Space Agency that established the first agreed estimates of the contribution of Antarctica and Greenland to sea level. For his research, he has received medals from the Royal Society London and the Australian Academy of Sciences. Please welcome Matt King. Well, thanks, uh, Ella, and it's great to be here with you tonight uh, to talk about climate science, uh, to begin with at least. Um, and, and in one regard, you won't be learning anything new tonight. Uh, hopefully you won't leave and shut your uh, screens down straight away. You're not going to learn anything new because climate science is not new. In 1856, an American scientific researcher, inventor and women's rights campaigner by the name of Eunice Foote uh, had her work presented at one of the most prestigious scientific sci societies in the world, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Her paper was, we understand, a world first. In it, she described the effects of the sun's rays on tubes of different gases. She demonstrated that heat from solar radiation was absorbed by carbon dioxide and water vapour and suggested this effect could be a cause of climate change. Now, Eunice's work disappeared from memory until recent years, but the work of an independent researcher at the same time in the UK, John Tyndall, did not. Uh, John Tyndall was looking at the same thing at about the same time, and he devised a simple but elegant experiment to explore the interaction of various gases with solar radiation. He concluded in 1859, thus the atmosphere admits of the entrance of the solar heat, but checks its exit, and the result is a tendency to accumulate heat at the surface of the planet. The atmosphere admits the entrance of heat and checks its exit, and the result is the accumulation of heat at the surface of the planet, 1859. And so while the science has developed further since then, as you'd expect, we've known for about 160 years that the atmosphere is a primary control on the temperature of the planet. It keeps the Earth's temperature at about 15 degrees Celsius instead of minus 18 degrees, as it would be without an atmosphere. Now, it's not even that colder here in Tasmania. And for 160 years, we've known that changing the composition of the atmosphere, notably, notably changing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, will lead to a change in Earth's climate. So if the science is that old, why are we still discussing it? Well, we're going to come back to that question uh, in the second part of my talk. But first, we're going to have a brief look at the evidence of climate change. So what do we know? Well, we know that after thousands of years of stable carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, that since the Industrial Revolution, the amount of carbon dioxide has increased by about 50%. And we know because of chemical fingerprints in the atmosphere that the change is driven entirely by burning of fossil fuels, that's coal and gas and petrol and things like that, and other human activity. All of the change. In fact, we know that the natural system, such as the oceans, have absorbed more carbon dioxide than before, meaning that without that role, the atmosphere would have had more carbon dioxide in it than it currently does. At present policy levels, we expect carbon dioxide will peak at about 670 parts per million, approaching triple the background levels of the last thousand years when human, human civilizations prospered. Now, one of the myths one hears is that these changes are tiny and hence can't be important. 
the increase in carbon dioxide, uh, after all, is only about 140 parts per million, or 0.014% of the atmosphere in absolute terms. To some, that seems ridiculously small to matter. But, the, but one thing, that, that myth ignores the science that we've had for 160 years, showing that small amounts of these gases really do matter. And two, anecdotally, we know that small bits of uh, changes in chemistry can matter. 10 milligrams of my heart medication uh, keep me alive, even though it's only 0.00001% of my body weight. And because carbon dioxide levels have gone up, we expect the Earth to trap more heat. And in 1938, an English steam engineer named Guy Callender uh, first identified a trend in the Earth's land temperatures, and he linked it to rising carbon dioxide levels. Callender hoped it would delay the, quote, return of the deadly glaciers, as he put it. Now, that was quite an understatement, as we'll soon see. Now, when we look at global measurements of Earth's temperature, including those so carefully prepared by the Australian uh, Bureau of Meteorology, we, we see exactly what Callender began to see. As we see on the right, by 2020, global average temperatures had risen by about 1.1 degrees Celsius since the Industrial Revolution. Most of that rise has happened since the 1960s. And if you were to look at the 10 hottest years in the global temperature record, you would see they all occurred in the last 15 years. The Earth is warming, and I don't think you need to be a scientist to tell it. We continue to emit carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases as we burn coal and gas and petrol and deforest the land. But the future emissions change will govern the next decades and centuries and beyond of the Earth's climate. Scientists can combine different emission scenarios with an understanding of the physics of the atmosphere and can pro project how the Earth will warm over the, uh, under those different scenarios. And we know that as a result, unless a very dramatic change occurs in human activity in the next decade or two, that Earth will warm by several degrees this century and more beyond that. The land will warm more than the ocean and extreme temperatures will become more extreme and more frequent than now. For instance, we now expect day temperatures in Western Sydney to, be, to go above 50 degrees at times in coming decades. Today's extreme temperatures will become more commonplace, and it's the extreme temperatures that will really bite us. Even with a global average uh, temperature warming of one and a half degrees, and that's only 0.4 of a degree from now, extreme hot days in regions like Australia will warm up by three degrees. Western Sydney could have an extra month of days over 35 degrees by 2090, an extra month of them. And there's global agreement amongst governments, including Australia's, that we must limit warming to that figure of 1.5 degrees if we're to avoid the worst of climate change. As shown on the left, those who are tracking current solid international policy targets say that current policies will limit average warming to 2.9 degrees, optimistically 2.1 degrees. And when you look at the impacts of such climate change, you start to see why concern is rising. Sea levels are already higher than at any time in the last 2,000 years. We all know that when you heat ice, it's going, to go, it's going to melt, and the Arctic in particular is warming at twice the average global rate. Almost all the glaciers globally are retreating, and the vast ice sheets of Antarctica and Greenland have begun to wake up in the last 30 years, and their change is now measured in hundreds of billions of tonnes of ice melt per year. And if you sum up the full picture, Earth lost 28 trillion tonnes of ice in the 23 years from 1994. Now, land ice melting drives up sea level, and about 30 centimetres is already locked in for the coming century, but a rise of up to a metre or even beyond is not outside the bounds of possibilities if climate change goes unchecked. Extreme sea levels will increase in frequency, just like air temperature extremes, and by the end of the century, in coastal Australian cities like Brisbane and Hobart and Melbourne, uh, what was a once in a hundred year coastal flood will occur between once every month and once every day if we do little about climate change. Now for Australians who love the coast, that is 
devastating news. That means shoreline retreat, beach erosion and inundation. It puts at risk $230 billion of Australian infrastructure. That's our homes, our businesses, our roads, our factories, our airports. In many places, those roads and houses were built on the edges of the beach and so there's nowhere for the beaches to retreat to. And so in places, a trip to the coast for our children and our grandchildren will look very, very different to the trip to the beach that we had when we were small. And while rich countries like Australia may well adapt to some extent, the poorest of the world will suffer the most from climate change. A UN report from 2016 highlighted that low-income countries are the hardest hit by weather-related disasters, 25 times more in terms of GDP. Those countries are already preconditioned, you see, to make adaptation to disasters very hard indeed. And increased extremes from climate change will only make that harder and bring that inequality higher. As this uh, slide shows, agricultural revenues will likely go up in the future with higher climate change, but productivity will go down as it's harder to do manual work in the heat. Food prices will increase dramatically, disasters will increase and health will suffer, with the net effect driving tens of millions more people into poverty by 2030, just nine years from now. In Bangladesh alone, 13 million people could be displaced from their homes and their livelihoods by 2050, just 29 years from now. And our nearest neighbours in the Pacific have vast fractions of their entire national infrastructure, tens to hundreds of metres from the current coastline. Climate change, you see, is not just about us and it's not just about the distant future. These changes are real, they're dangerous, they're on our doorstep and humanity is driving them. The experiments of Foote and Tyndall were not politically motivated. Thermometers are not issued by political parties or activist groups. These are real changes and we're seeing the Earth behave in the way that the physics of the atmosphere and the Earth system would expect. One of the world's most prominent carbon research institutes did research into climate change in the 1980s and it recognised the impact it would have on the planet. But the organisation didn't respond to that knowledge in the way that you might expect. Although when I tell you the company's name was Exxon, now part of Exxon Mobil, you may understand why. In 1988, Exxon consciously adopted a position that would emphasise the uncertainty of the science. Just as consensus was emerging in the climate science community that humans were driving the climate change we were seeing, Exxon chose to emphasise the uncertainty. And Exxon weren't the only ones. In 1998, a communications expert called James Walker delivered the Global Climate Science Communications Plan. Sounds really promising. He delivered it to the American Petroleum Institute, a peak body invo involving Exxon, Chevron, and other companies interested in petroleum and coal. The plan, again, aimed to promote discussion of uncertainty and undermine what was already then abundantly clear. The Guardian newspaper reported that the plan sounded much like a 1960s PR campaign devised by the tobacco industry to delay controls by questioning the science that showed that smoking killed. And some of the people involved in this new plan were in fact veterans of the tobacco industry campaigns. You see, Exxon knew about climate change, the American Petroleum Institute knew, and they acted to sow doubts in the minds of the global public just at a time when the science was coming extraordinarily clear. And they did it because of self-interest. There was a deception. But I think also there was a self-deception. There's no doubt in my mind that many of us wanted to be reassured that we didn't need to change. Our nations didn't need to change, our businesses didn't need to change, we as individuals didn't need to change. We wanted to be unconcerned about climate change. And Pope Francis actually picked up on this theme and said that human selfishness is responsible for climate change. Now, given that statement from the Pope, there's some irony then that Christians in Australia have often led the charge of scepticism or doubt or just plain unconcern about climate change, even though it's been long been clear that the world's poorest 
would be affected the most by it. Now, you may have been invited by a Christian here tonight and they may well be squirming in their seats right now. Don't worry, they will cope. I personally think there's great theological reasons why Christians shouldn't be the least surprised that the humans are busily heating the planet to extreme levels and deceiving one another in the process. But even if we have the best of intentions, we know that human psychology works against us. We know that given a choice of one bag of lollies today and two bags next month, most of us will take the one bag today. Hazards on the horizon don't seem as big and as threatening as smaller hazards immediately in front of us. And that's, of course, where good policy comes in, because it can recognise those trade-offs and consider the greater good. And especially so when you consider it's not the year-to-year that matters, but the cumulative adding of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Smoking one cigarette may not have an obvious effect, but 20 years of daily cigarettes will do and will kill you. But I wanted to finish with hope, because there is hope. There are ways to mitigate the effects of climate change, to adapt to it by better house design, better urban planning. Growing trees in your garden or or street can reduce urban temperatures by several degrees. Planting even one small tree in the right place can produce a cooling effect of equivalent of two air conditioners. Small changes, you see, can make a massive difference in the livability of our cities, our towns, our houses. But to avoid the worst of climate change and its impact on the world's poorest, we have to get emissions down and we have to get them down to net zero and very quickly. The change in government in the US will rapidly drive change in global expectations on climate change. China has now pledged to be carbon neutral by 2060. Not nearly enough, but more ambitious than Australia. One can expect future trade deals with Australia to require more dramatic action from Australia on reducing emissions and exiting out of coal and gas as quickly as possible. Now, there has been a massive reduction in the cost of renewables, such that they are now the cheapest mass market energy source. We do still need to crack the energy storage issue, but distributed energy generation of wind and ocean energy, solar energy, pumped hydro, batteries and hydrogen generation may produce a combined solution. In my opinion, we should have had a discussion about nuclear power decades ago, but the timescales of nuclear power approvals and building would be, would be simply too slow, and that has left us uh, as not being an option. Now, the good news is that humanity has tackled big problems before. In 1985, the hole in the ozone layer was discovered, and global action was quickly taken. In the early 1990s, another hole was discovered, this one in terms of retirement savings, one that would, uh, that one that would have the worst effects decades down the track, just like climate change, and compulsory superannuation contributions were introduced to address it. The destruction in Darwin by Cyclone Tracy resulted in mo- major changes to building codes. And all of those show that we can respond and respond quickly to large crises, even if they're over the horizon or feel remote, and we can act for the benefit of others who follow us. And the winds are uh, are changing in society. The Australian Farmers Federation now have a climate change policy. Car manufacturers are abandoning petrol engines. Australia has the highest uptake of rooftop solar in the world and 2020 broke our previous record by almost 40%. Most of us would like our kids and our grandkids to inherit an environment that was at least as good as the one that we've grown up in. Most of us would like to avoid further burdening the poorest of the world. But the worst of climate change will make life harder for everyone. It will erode our coastlines, it will uh, destroy ecosystems, it will hit economies the poor will suffer. But happily, there are things we can do now, things we can do individually, things we can do corporately, things that we can do in policy. Solutions exist and the motivation is there if we consider not just our own interests, but also the interests of others. There is hope, and one of the greatest bits of hope is that you've bothered to join us here tonight. Thank you for your time.
Thank you so much, Matt, for bringing your expertise to this discussion. Don't forget that you have an opportunity to send in your questions that I'll be asking our speakers later on in the evening. So don't forget that you can do that by clicking the join in button just above your screen. It is my absolute privilege tonight to now introduce you to our second speaker, Mikey Lynch. Mikey is the campus director of the University Fellowship of Christians here at the University of Tasmania. He was a founder of the Vision 100 network in Tasmania and is currently a board member of the Geneva Push National Church Planting Network. He's also the chairman of New Front Door, the Church IT Guild. Mikey has hosted a blog and multiple podcasts and is the author of The Good Life in the Last Days, Making Choices When the Time is Short, and the forthcoming book, The Vine Movement, Building Trellises for the Global Vine. Let's give a warm welcome to Mikey Lynch. Well, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Matt. Heavy topic, but um, but important stuff. So let's go ahead in time then uh, to 2050. Global heating has already passed the 1.5 degree mark a couple of years earlier and is now accelerating towards three degrees, possibly even four degrees, by the end of the century. So forecast Jonathan Watts writing in The Guardian in 2019. He writes... Imagine, it feels as if the dial on a cooker has been turned up from 9 o'clock to midnight. Los Angeles, Sydney, Madrid, Lisbon, possibly even Paris endure new highs in excess of 50 degrees. London's climate resembles that of Barcelona 30 years earlier. Across the world, droughts and extreme heat become a fact of life for 1.6 billion city dwellers. For a while, marathons and World Cups and Olympics were moved to winter, to avoid the, uh, the furnace-like temperatures in many cities, and now they're not held at all. It's impossible to justify the emissions, and the world is no longer in the mood for games. Extreme weather is the overriding concern of all but a tiny elite. It wrecks havoc everywhere, but the greatest misery is felt, as Matt has already said, in the poorest countries. Dhaka, Dar es Salaam, and other coastal cities are hit almost every year by storm surges and other extreme sea level incidents that used to occur only once a century. Following the lead set by Jakarta, several capitals have relocated to less exposed regions, but floods, heat waves, droughts, and fires are increasingly catastrophic. Healthcare systems are struggling to cope. The econ economic costs cripple poorly prepared financial institutions. Insurance companies refuse to provide cover for natural disasters. Insecurity and desperation sweep through populations. Governments struggle to cope. Now, I normally don't read articles like that, to be honest. <laughs> I don't know about you. I just find them so depressing. They make me feel anxious and physically ill, nauseous, frightened, and I don't really help me do anything. Uh, but they're big issues, aren't they? And every now and then, it's important to stop and consider them. There's an amazing little film, actually Grady lent it to me, a, a film called First Reformed by Paul Schrader, written by Paul Schrader, directed by him and starring Ethan Hawke. And it's uh, a story about a pastor of a small little historic church who meets with the husband of a wife in his congregation. He meets with her at her request because he is so distressed and, and strung out at these kinds of issues that he wants his wife to have an abortion. How can you sanction bringing a girl, for argument's sake, let's say we're having a girl, full of hope and, and naive belief into a world when that little girl grows up to be a young woman and she looks you in the eyes and says, you knew all along, didn't you? What do you say then? It's not the first time the human race has faced terrible things. The so-called Ice Age, the Pleistocene glacial period ending 15,000 years ago wasn't a walk in the park. The Black Death in the 14th century wiped out something like a third of the population of Europe. Or the World Wars of the 20th century followed by then the shadow of, of nuclear war hanging over the last 70 years. 70 years. That, that, that historic perspective does help us recognise just how wonderfully comfortable the last 70 years has been for many 
in certain parts of the world. But now we face another terrifying, catastrophic future, which we, as, as Matt has spoken about, are um, directly responsible for and have been slow to act on preventing, even mitigating. So in the light of all that, let me ask this question. A terrible question, really, to ask. What if, on the graphs there, the worst happens? What if the worst happens? How do you sit with that question? What if when my children are the age that I am now, they're living in a dirtier, scarier, riskier, more limited world? What if I grow old in a, in a world that is unable to guarantee my safety, <laughs> let alone my comfort? And what are those unthinkable millions and billions of people in the world, suffering in extreme, unstoppable ways. What, what, what then? In that film I mentioned, First Reformed, the pastor says, it comes down to choice. We choose hope or despair. Courage is the solution to despair. We can't be certain what the future holds. We must choose despite uncertainty. Wisdom is the ability to hold two contradictory thoughts in your mind simultaneously, hope and despair. A life without despair is a life without hope. Holding these ideas in your head is life itself. Well, let's wrestle with that challenge, hope and despair. Sometimes we need to contemplate this prospect. We're doing it tonight in person and around the world, around Australia, what if the worst happens? Name that fact that we're pondering. And all of us are, even if on some subconscious level, by kind of ignoring it and hoping it will go away. If we don't rush to deny it or ignore it or rush to easy, optimistic, reassuring solutions, sometimes we need to ask the question, what? What then? Well, let me ponder with you two destructive but kind of understandable reactions. Despair and rage. Despair. You think about this stuff, sit through Matt's address tonight and, and feel overwhelming grief leading to maybe depression or just, just a kind of numb apathy. And, and that can lead to then a despair of destructive or indulgent behaviour to somehow cope. The Bible prophet Isaiah quotes people in that kind of circumstance, saying, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Or even in a grim, pragmatic proverb in the Bible, give beer to those who are perishing, wine to those who are in anguish, let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. Now, I had some ex-Christian mates in uni who liked that Bible verse. <laughs> But it's not meant to be a good one. It's a sad one. Despair is an understanding, passive, destructive response. It's understandable. Rage is another. These things are so extreme, aren't they? They're so scary that we can feel this urge to sort of lash out at something, like a, a wounded dog. Maybe lashing out in rage to try and protect myself, my family. Um, Maybe furious, a desperate attempt to try and make things better because extreme times call for extreme measures. But shouldn't there be things that we don't contemplate even in the worst of situations? Isn't there some things we don't want to become no matter what the context? Because rage can lead to violence, extremism, militant upheaval, flocking to radical, violent leaders who promise change or promise security. But at what cost? Fear and despair, we can end up, can't we, <laughs> in rage and violence. These things can even be thrown at God, you know. Again, like in that film I mentioned. There's a Bible psalm that begins with famous words that Jesus himself even took on his lips uh, in a different context. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from me when I cry to you? 
It's a whole Bible book, famous book about a character named Job crying out in anguish to God at his worst, saying, where are you, God? What are you doing? You're piercing me with arrows. Where is your justice? And hey, it is understandable. These are understandable reactions to these feelings, this sick panic, this hollow sadness. So how do we survive spiritually, personally, in our humanity, in our community, without giving way to despair and rage or hiding from unwelcome realities? I want to speak about hope, eternal hope. Because the the promise of the Christian faith is not comfort and safety and peace and, and prosperity and health and stability now in the world, in my life, in your life. The, the worst of worst case scenarios of some kind of near extinction event on earth doesn't contradict the Bible's promises or the Christian faith or Jesus' teaching. I don't, may it not be so, Lord. I, I, it's horrible to contemplate, but I dare hope we can prevent the worst case scenarios. But the Bible doesn't promise us, oh, it, don't worry, everything will be fine for you in this life. The focus on the Bible is speaking to us of an eternal hope, even as we wrestle with these temporal questions. This comes from the Bible book of Romans, which says uh, in Romans chapter 8, verse 18. I consider our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed, for the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. A hope that is guaranteed in Jesus of a renewed world, of a repaired world, of a healed, transformed, forgiven humanity guaranteed by Jesus' own miraculous physical resurrection from the dead as a first kind of fruits, the Bible says, the first harvest of what's to come, an eternal wonderful hope for us and for our our world, our groaning world. And that understanding gives us perspective on things. On the one hand, it enables us to be able to say, you know what, things aren't going to be okay in this life. Things aren't are not going to be okay. A hope that is sure can allow us to contemplate even this unique emergency, this dramatic, catastrophic change facing our planet. And in the light of even a worst case, hope can sustain us and comfort us and, I hope, humanise us and preserve us so that true eternal hope in Christ can keep us from despair or rage. And then whether it is a worst case scenario or God willing, one of the better ones for the future, we can get on with doing what we can. Diligently, seriously, humanely, lovingly, spiritually. So I hope in a strange way, you see, kind of helps us be able to say everything won't be okay now. Because we can have the space to face hard realities. But of course, also, an eternal hope is saying everything will ultimately be okay on an eternal level. So that this passage can go on to say that all things, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. And that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. It enables us to adjust our perspective on what okay is. That okay 
is safe with God, secure in his hope, carried in his purposes even through hard times, that God is with me now. It can be okay to serve God even in a terrible future. Uh, As people had to do through the Black Death or the World Wars, they still served God, prayed to God, loved one another, carried on in terrible, unimaginable horror. People do find ways to live in hard circumstances, find meaning, find consolation, find comfort, find fulfilment in horrible, unimaginable circumstances. When we have hope, we find a way. So as I draw towards a close, yes, there are, there are things I can't control, you can't control. And there are different levels of control we each have, depending on our place, who we are, where we are in the world, locally, globally. There's some things I can do and there's a lot I can't do for myself, for my family, for my country, for my world. I'm just one man, you're just one man, one woman. We're vulnerable in many ways. I'm vulnerable. (laughs) We're vulnerable to one another. And ultimately, God's purpose we can't control. And yet I can and should do what I can and should. With who I am, with what I know, to learn to be wise, to be prepared and be generous, to be bold and to be honest. I do believe, as I hope I've tried to sort of pitch to you, that Christian hope gives true comfort and powerful resources to face grim futures without giving in to despair or to rage, and so to do what is right as best as I can with a hope that comforts and a hope that sustains me. I can face this present that I'm thrown into and and look at this future that's coming up to meet me and do what I can to do what is right, to pray, to love, to give, to speak, to change, to vote, to research, to write, to invest. Because of my faith in God, who is there, the hope for my eternal future he gives me in Christ, I can dare to live in love in this uncertain present. Why don't you join us? Thanks. Welcome back to The Edge. Just as a reminder, my name is Ella Hickey and I am your moderator tonight. I want to welcome back up Mikey Lynch and Matt King, who are our experts this evening, to a live panel discussion. So now is your time to ask questions. It's your final opportunity to keep sending those questions in. So really, this event is designed for you, for you to take our speakers to the edge. So remember, you can do this by clicking the join in box that's just above your screen. Now, I'm going to start off with a question that I have for Matt, because I actually Googled polar geodesy, because I thought, I better get, become an expert. Uh, and his name just came up. So I He no just made there. up the name then. <laughs> so please, tell me, what is polar geodesy? Uh, yeah, look, that's a great question. And, and do we have only 40 minutes? <laughs> um, no, so, so geodesy is, is, a, is a, an old science. In fact, it's an ancient science. It's the study of the shape of the Earth, uh, the, how the Earth rotates, its gravity field, and how those things change over time. Uh, and by studying those things, we can uh, study sea level change and the ice sheets and how they're changing. Uh, and so I do that with a polar focus. OK, well, that's good to know. <laughs> I also have a question for you, Mikey. You've got a young family and you work with a lot of young adults uh, at the university. How can we, and I'm sure lots of parents here are wondering this question, how can we talk to young people about climate change when they have all uh, this fake news bombarded at them? How do we help them with wisdom to really sort through the information that's being thrown at them? Yeah, well, it's, it's some ways it's using something that Christians, especially in in my tradition, the kind of reformed kind of tradition, has had a focus on in a different context, the kind of uh, discerning worldview, analysing, worrying over, not just accepting everything you're told. It's using that stuff which can be rightly applied to a worldly worldview or a questionable theological framework. 
It's using those same tools and, and applying those then to actually all the media that's being thrown our way. So in some ways that was done, those working with uni students on campuses in the past would do that. We'd look at a newspaper article that, you know, an evening news broadcast, they're the only times news came, once a, once a day, you know, <laughs> maybe twice a day. And you could analyse that news and, and teach people to be discerning about how news came to them. It's now obviously coming all the time and from many, many sources um, who may not be that responsible and, and even our news resources are under pressure and so they're not necessarily presenting the best reporting always either. And so it's using those same tools, discernment really, but just saying discernment doesn't mean just disagreeing with whatever the, the non-Christian says. Sometimes it's filtering that stuff and, and, I, and so we, we've started to do that more and to say here's how you assess a website or a Facebook post or an opinion piece and actually assess that um, discerningly as a Christian. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thanks, mm. Mikey. We have a question from Will in Hobart for Matt. He says, what have you seen with your own eyes that has convinced you of the importance of addressing the crisis? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. So, look, um, uh, so I've, I've had the, 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 the good privilege and blessing to go to Antarctica and Greenland and Iceland and um, certain in Antarctica, I, the parts of Antarctica I was visiting were uh, unchanged for thousands of years and you got that feeling that you were standing in a place that hadn't felt the fingerprints of humanity on it in any way, shape or form or, or even the boot steps uh, on it in some cases. Um, when you go to Greenland and Iceland, it's a very different thing. You can see in the landscape um, change that's actually quite recent. And, and actually, we have um, aerial photographs going back uh, 100 years in both of those places where you can actually see the retreats of the glaciers in very visual form. Um, and it's shocking because you can stand there even in a sort of tourist spot and look and see the photograph of where the glacier was in 1926 and where it is now, and it's way up there, uh, and it's, it's not one glacier, it's not two glaciers, it's, it's, it's uh, the vast swathe of the glaciers. And so the very uh, telling records of the change that's underway. Um, and, you know, we, we, we know intuitively when, when you heat up uh, uh, ice, it melts. And so, this, the, the, you know, we can make that connection to climate change really quickly through the glaciers, yeah. We have a question here that I'm going to start with you, Mikey. It says, does the Bible have anything to say about climate science? No, not directly, no. Um, but it, it does speak about human beings as God's appointed rulers over the world. And, uh, and that's an enormous responsibility. Uh, it's not a, one, a reckless one that we use it simply for human interests alone or human convenience alone but to as the image of God rule the world responsibly means we need to be attentive as we become, you know, I mean, Adam names the animals, he becomes familiar with the animals um, in, in Eden, as um, Genesis 2 describes. We want to, as we name more and more things, I, I think many theologians see the naming of the animals as the beginning of that. It goes into Solomon, who then names the plants that crawl up the wall and all the proverbs, and, and so I think an extension of that Eden project um, about how we wisely rule over the world. We, we shouldn't be a despot who sits in some palace while our nation, the planet, is in ruins, uh, like Scar and the Lion King. <laughs> but we should rule the world responsibly. I think that's the line I'd kind of take. Yeah. yeah um, and so, yeah, so um, I, think, I, think, I think that's absolutely right. Um, I think there's another angle in that you know, the, 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 one of the, the cores of the Christian belief is this idea that in, that in rejecting God, we've, you know, humanity has gone to the, is going to the depths of where human, you could imagine humanity could go to. Um, and, um, and that has, as Mikey talked about in his talk, that has that is far global consequences. Um, and so you would expect that, um, you know, some people have said, I've seen US senators say, you know, it, it couldn't be that humanity could actually uh, uh, impact the global climate because that's, that's somehow God's domain. Um, but I think a right thinking in terms of Christian thinking is that actually nothing's really without outside of that realm of, of humans' negative impact as we go about stewarding the world in, in a negative way, as we badly steward the world. Um, and so I personally think that Christians should... should you know, we, don't, we don't see climate change science in the Bible, but I don't think we should be surprised that it happens at all. I don't know 
what the first readers and hearers of the book of Revelation understood it to mean, but there is a verse in Revelation 11 that speaks of God bringing judgment, destroying those who destroy the earth, which is a striking uh, has a whole other resonance now. Yeah. yeah. So thank you for that. We have a question here for Matt that says, what does net zero emissions actually mean? Yeah, so that's a, that's a, a good question. So it basically means that, um, uh, well, one way of viewing net zero emissions is that you don't emit anything. Um, that would be zero human emissions into the atmosphere. Um, but you, you, there are uh, ways of soaking up um, uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, planting forests, things like that. Uh, trees grow, they soak up carbon dioxide. So you can be offsetting some of the emissions. So you can still emit some into the atmosphere because it comes back out of the atmosphere. Um, so that's what it's talking about. It's talking purely about the human uh, carbon emissions side of things. The natural system has been in fantastic balance for uh, thousands of years. Um, and it will continue to do its thing. And as I said, it's been helping us out. Um, but humanity has to get itself where it's balanced. Yeah, that's really helpful. Here's one that I think will strike some interesting conversation. It says, hope and despair. How do we choose when we hear what Matt spoke about? Start with you, Mikey. You said a bit of that question, I see. How do we choose between hope and despair uh, when we hear about what Matt shared. Yeah, that was what I was trying to explore. Yeah, I, so I think I, I, it's a, an artist's flourish in the film quote that says you hold together hope and despair together. You know, that, that's a poetic way of describing, in a sense, in that quote, despair means, you know, grim, fearful pessimism of a sort. Yeah. So I don't think ultimately a Christian is given way to despair, properly speaking, but may well... As on a, on a very small level, anybody who's known anybody who's received that terrible phone call from a doctor about a certain prognosis um, has to then look into it and ask, what does it mean to live with that, um, you know, like a much shorter life than I thought I'd have? Yeah, that not all people who get that phone call then give in to despair, even though there is now a grim pessimism for their life, but actually, you know, they actually then many can testify to even having hope in the midst of that. Yeah, and so that's what we'll look for. Yeah, and I think the, the, um, the, the, the right response still at this point of time is alarm and concern, but I don't think it is, humanly speaking, despair. Uh, I think the best of the climate communicators, uh, those scientists who are talking about climate science with the public on a regular basis, are still talking about hope, and they're not doing that in a, in a way that's just fooling us. Um, but, the, you know, there is still time to get this sorted. Um, there is time in the next two decades, but, but, it, but it's, it's, it's urgency, it's a call to arms. We have to get going. We, there's no more time for um, messing around. We, we, you know, we need to do... We ha every day counts from here to, you know, over the next decades. That alarm is worse. It's worse and worse, yeah. Here's one for you, Mikey. Why should Christians be concerned about climate change? Because we're in charge of ruling God's world, we should be concerned about anything that tells us we're not doing that well and repent of things that, uh, that are out of gross self-interest uh, causing destructive harm. Uh, but also, Matt really helpfully showed us the humanitarian concern as well. So if you won't care about your responsibility for the glaciers um, and so forth, then show your concern for the world's poorest. Love your neighbour as yourself. Jesus said. Um, so the whole law and the prophets hang on that, he said. So even if it's just a humanitarian, I don't think it's only humanitarian. Um, and heck, we could even go one step further, couldn't we, and say that in the end it'll be economically disastrous for you. So it's bad business, it's bad finance. So even if that's all we can appeal to you on. And that's starting to become an issue with some as well, yeah? Yeah, no, no I mean, certainly the, the economists in the last decade or so have been, well, not all economists, of course, um, uh, but... Um, but a, 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 you know, a growing fraction are saying, actually, the cost of not acting is going to be much, much worse than acting. Um, both of them have real costs uh, to the economy, um, but actually the, the better choice is the one that actually results in uh, a greater chance of human flourishing and, uh, and our descendants actually having a, uh, an environment that we would like them to have. My little book um, wrestles with ethics and eschatology, end times. What to think about the end times, the end of the world and stuff, life after death. And one of the big points in that book, and in 
good, healthy Christian theology is to say that eschatology doesn't erase ethics. And so a famous quote that Martin Luther may or may not have actually said is, um, even if I knew Jesus was coming back tomorrow, I'd still plant a tree today. Now, that's a saying that captures the sense of there's still ethical duties today that God's given me to do today, and it's not for me to say, ah, Jesus is coming back for tomorrow, so you know, I don't need, I could suspend ethics. There's a question that uh, flows on from that oh. that says, Mikey, I want hope now. How can I have hope now? Jesus came in order to uh, not just speak about hope, but actually to bring hope, not in the sense of I wish or maybe, but in the sense of a short prospect. So a Christian uses hope in that sense of something I anticipate for sure. It's just not yet. Yeah, so in Jesus, we see a death for the forgiveness of the world and reconciliation with God and a risen life anew as a beginning of a new life for humanity and the world. And his message was, follow me. Turn away from your rejection of God. Turn, follow me. And in me, you'll have life, forgiveness, hope forever. Thank you for that. Matt, uh, this question asks, please comment on the assertion that global warming caused by human activity is negligible compared to that caused by natural causes, for example, volcanoes. Yeah, so that's, that's a really common myth. And um, it, to be honest, if you read the Australian newspaper, you would have read that type of thing uh, quite a lot. Um, it, it's entirely a myth. You know, that, for example, it's often said that volcanoes emit many times uh, what human, humans emit on a, an annual basis. That is just blatantly and falsely, uh, uh, blatantly untrue. Um, uh, volcanoes emit something like 0.2% of what humans emit every year. Um, it's just, a, it's, a, it's almost negligible. Uh, and of course, the world has uh, uh, been having volcanic eruptions and soaking up that carbon dioxide uh, for, for thousands of years. And so that's just part of the natural system. There's, there's bumps and peaks in the natural cycle. But humans are, are driving a major new experiment since the Industrial Revolution and especially over the last 60 years. You've heard it right here, folks. Fake news. <laughs> mm. So, Matt, what can we as individuals actually do to help with slowing, the slowing down of climate change from an individual level? Yeah, so, so the first thing I, I, I say here is perhaps will surprise you. The first and most powerful thing that you can do to uh, work, help with climate change is to talk about climate change. Um, to put it on the agenda amongst your family, amongst your friends, in your workplaces when you go to work tomorrow or study tomorrow, whatever you do, whoever you speak to on the phone, tell, talk to them about tonight. Um, that, that actually uh, helps other people have the confidence to actually think, actually, this is an issue that that actually is concerning and we need to think about and, and do something about. Uh, and so that's the number one thing, is to talk about climate change. Um, and the second thing is, 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 you know, the range of very localised um, actions you can, you can do. You can um, think about, can I actually catch a bit more public transport or work, walk to work, um, as, as some of us can do? Um, you know, are solar panels actually within my reach? Can I join the very large number of Australians with solar panels on their roof? Or can I begin planning for that over the next few years financially? Um, can I, can I um, uh, do a little bit more recycling? You know, that's sort of the basic level stuff. Um, can I get my kids to actually catch the bus to school rather than dropping them off um, at school? Um, and, um, and thirdly, there's right to your politician. Um, uh, especially if you voted for them and they're elected, um, because uh, they listen to people who vote for them. Uh, and we're told uh, constantly that actually the amount of communication they receive about these issues is something that they respond to. Uh, and so uh, a mini avalanche of letters going into your local politician and telling them, I voted for you, but I, I want to see greater action on climate change um, for our kids' sake or, or whatever, that, that I think can have an important impact. That's really helpful. Uh, this next question is for both of you. How might we change church cultures so that climate justice and caring for God's creation are seen as a necessary part of being a faithful disciple of Jesus? Do you start, Mikey? Yeah, culture change is a, is a long, slow thing. And, and so it, it, leaders play a part in that. And uh, 
in some ways on one level this is a to choose to host this topic, which I suspect amongst some of their stakeholders and supporters will be controversial for City Bible Forum, it was an act of leadership, so we, um, we the panel, applaud City Bible Forum um, uh, for doing that. So, so there's things like that. Um, there's, there's the grassroots level stuff. I mean, part of it is actually, um, oh, do I have anything else to say? Am I just waffling because I'm a preacher? Let me start there, Tag. And I'm keen to hear oh. what you have to say as well, actually, Ella. Yeah. That was a... Very bad uh, hospital yeah. pass, Mike. Yeah, Thank sorry. You. So, look, I think the, the similar, similar. I, I don't know if organisationally is the right way to go at it. So, thinking, okay, the leaders of the church need yeah. to actually activate their people on climate change. I think, you know, as we go about life with one another as Christians, well, we're going to be talking about the things that matter to us, you know, and there's going to be uh, spiritual things we talk about. There's going to be, um, you know, going to work, and there's going to be climate change, and we're going to be talking about that. And we're going to be thinking together. Well, what should we be doing, you know, individually, or maybe what should we be doing together that actually can help contribute to this, to you know, to show that we're actually uh, taking this seriously as we should do. So I, I guess that's where I'd come come at it from. Ellen. Yeah, that's great. I will take up Mikey's mantle and share a couple of thoughts that I had. Uh, both of you are absolutely correct. From a leadership level, absolutely. Uh, but also having those conversations. So you talked about the individual sort of uh, impact that you can have. Having conversations, having conversations are so powerful in, you know, churches have small groups, have those conversations, ask the question, so what do you think about climate change? And that might be difficult, it might be challenging for some, but I think that that just opens up those conversations. And as Mikey said, culture change is always very slow, um, but it, if you've got to start somewhere, um, because it happens, culture does change, and it just starts with the conversations, really. I've just, I've been, you're buying time by getting you guys to talk as well. Uh, I suppose part of what culture changes also through habits and routines and normal shift and, and artifacts and patterns, all these things. Culture's not just words, is it, or just leaders. Um, and so I guess there's a whole bunch of things that become normals and acceptable normals um, and, and possible futures. I guess that kind of imagination of what's a desirable way to live and the future and things to value. And so I guess there... You know, because it's more than, in some ways, it's more than just recycling or catching the transport, is it? But it's also, how do I make decisions about who I vote for in a multifaceted way rather than a one-issue way? Or um, how do I be someone who just feels a generalised sense of responsibility as a global citizen? Things like that. And I think some of those things come down to how we pray in our prayer newsletters, um, the kind of holidays we take. Oh, there's a whole bunch of little things, I guess, that have become the habits and routines of life that makes things imaginable. Yeah. That's really great. Mm. Uh, Matt, why is it that it's mostly Christians who are leading the fight against measures to try and stop human-caused climate change? Oh, look, look, I, I, I will um, blame Christians in part, but I wouldn't say that they're mainly uh, uh, involved. I don't know how many people on the board of Exxon in 1988 were Christians. I suspect there were a bunch of people who weren't Christians or, you know, other religions. Um, uh, so, look, I, I don't think so. In Australia, we've had a, a, a number of, it would be true, a number of prominent Christians, you know, particularly in uh, political life and, uh, and uh, associated lobby groups. Um, and, look, I th look I, I'd be interested in what I've heard other people think. I think there's a, there's a, um, a, a general conservatism uh, towards life to change. Uh, there's a conservatism towards big government. And so anything that looks like government needing to reach its long arm out and impose taxes and things like that we don't like. Um, I think many uh, of those Christians in leadership positions are, are very safely in the middle class and we've got shares and we've got vested interests in um, uh, organisations. And it's also true that, um, uh, you know, the Australian Minerals Council is one of the largest lobby organisations in Canberra and has been in their ear for a long time, uh, telling them about jobs, you know, and we care about jobs, we care about people, so we, we want them to have employment. Uh, and so there's a bunch of uh, complicated issues behind this. Um, I, I, I don't think we're going to unpick that entirely. We have to actually move to a new way of thinking and go, actually, we've moved beyond that phase now to a point where we actually realise that actually we need to um, take some serious action and quickly, yeah. Yeah, that's good insight. Uh, we have another one for you, Matt. How can we counter the extreme scepticism and the distrust of scientists when the evidence is so convincing. 
Yeah, look, uh, wh look, one of the reasons why I was glad that this event was on and I was, you know, happy to accept is that I think you need to have trusted voices in any conversation, yeah, so, so um, and, and even though I haven't met um, most of the people on the uh, live stream, I dare say, and uh, uh, some of the people in this, in Hobart here, um, I hope that I can, in, in coming from a very similar place to some of the Christians, um, uh, that I can come as somewhat a trusted voice, that I come from the same worldview. There's a, there's a well-known climate scientist in the US called Catherine Hayhoe, uh, who's a Christian, from, she's from, the, uh, from Canada originally, but uh, works in the South in Texas. Uh, and she, she actually, um, her bread and butter climate communication is going from church group to church group and actually saying, look, I'm a, I'm a Christian just like you. Um, this is what I can tell you about climate science. And actually, the, the, it's incredibly winsome. Uh, and so having trusted voices is actually really important. You go, actually, uh, I can see someone who's, who thinks about the world just like me, um, and yet uh, they're saying, based on their expert knowledge, that actually climate change is happening and it's being driven by humans and it's, and it's dangerous, but there's something we can do about it. Yeah, that's great. Uh, here's one for you, Mikey. Is this approach that you're describing not simple apathy smuggled under the guise of hope? No. <laughs> I, was, I was saying that hope actually can enable us, can potentially give us the resources to face a grim future rather than want to hide from it. Um, and within then that emotional strength that hope gives you then enable you to, to act. That's uh, it's uh, it an activism driven by some longer term security. It's not, the, uh, yeah, so that, that's what I was trying to get at. I mean, I, I think we could add to other reasons. There's a bunch, there's a mess of theological things that are wonderful truths in scripture that can be weaponized by being out of whack. Jesus is going to come back and make everything new, therefore who cares about this world is one of those. Um, where, to, where to rule the world, therefore anything that suggests that humans uh, do it badly is somehow misanthropic and anti-human you know, anti or something like this. Um, uh, yeah, the big government thing. So, you know, God gives a restraint on human governments. Government, there's more to life than government. Um, therefore, any massive problem that can primarily needs to be addressed by large government mechanisms is therefore, in it, you know, necessarily Orwellian or something like this. So there's a bu bunch of those um, things that we need to kind of face by actually reading our Bibles more carefully and having a, a, a cyclical sort of spiral approach to Scripture where we look at Scripture and look at our world, look at Scripture again and realise maybe we hadn't fully understood its implications and then look back. And, and that cycling in means that we might see new things that we hadn't seen as, as clearly before. And so, um, yeah, so even that discernment thing I was discussing before, um, being trained in discernment can actually equip Christians to be uh, conspiracy theorists because we're already, in a sense, aware of the devil's conspiracy. Do you see what I mean? And so we can be primed to lean that way. And, and I suspect probably differing views on creation and evolution is another whole other topic. But if you've already think that science has got it wrong there, then, yeah, you put up a graph that t talks in tens or hundreds, of thousands, millions of years, then suddenly you've stopped listening. So there's, there's a bunch of these other things we've got to do work on, I think. Yeah, yeah that's, that's great. Uh, this one's for both of you. I fear the issue amongst most, most humans, including Christians, is not despair or, or rage, but apathy. How do we overcome this human condition? Wow. Okay. Yeah. But I, look, I, I think that is the danger. I think you know the reason why have we had not seen profound uh, action. You know, weekly um, uh, protests of a million people in in the big cities in Australia. Why aren't we seeing that? We have seen that. You know, at different uh, epochs in in the last decades. Um, um, look, people people are understanding, understandably wanting to to live their lives and and um, I guess have finite energy to t to to maintain the momentum, you know, unless that's your thing, you know, it's hard to get up out of bed every day and go, well, I'm going to be passionate about climate change yet again, despite the fact that, you know, not much seems to be happening in the political uh, uh, system, for instance. So, uh, but, but I think, um, I think that that's why when we talk about hope, we talk about the things that are happening. Um, we, we talk about the things that actually are going to, ha that, that will eventually happen, that there's a, there's a freight train that's just getting up to speed, 
uh, now, and actually we don't want to be get left, left behind on that because there is action that's occurring, there is more action coming down the pipeline. Do we want to be late adopters or early adopters? I think we want to be early adopters. Uh, there's much to be gained by being an early adopter of, uh, of some of the change. And so I, so I think that actually, you know, seeing that there, there's something coming is, is somewhere um, uh, towards that answer, but I am, I think, waffling as well, so hopefully that's what might... It's a killer, time. isn't it? Yeah, that's thank right. you. Yeah. Look, I mean, partly the apathy is understandable because there is, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, there's a limit to what you could do mm. and what I could do, actually. And so you're right in being apathetic. It's not up to you. Uh, but you could be someone who works hard at your uni and works hard at your career and ends up becoming someone who could do something. Or homeschool so diligently that you raise kids who excel during their university years and go on to be someone who does something. <laughs> do, do you see what I mean? And so, so I guess sometimes individual apathy, uh, the instinct to be an individual activist, either in marches or in personally being the change you want to see in the world, that's one way of acting, but in a sense doesn't bring about the change. It feels great and it does play a part, um, but actually in a weird way, our church community is raising up a few key science leaders, government leaders, and so on and so forth, um, uh, you know, aid workers in some, you know, sacrificial aid workers willing to go to the, the front lines of, of sea level rise or whatever. Um, it may be a whole community that raises a few people that make a disproportionate influence. So I guess that's a, a long view thought as well, your individual sense of disempowerment can be separated from your contribution to a larger impact. Yeah, that's really helpful. So this next question uh, transitions to sustainability for you, Matt. Uh, your thoughts on global and personal limits. Are we simply changing addiction from hydrocarbons to other forms of energy? Um, look, I, I think it's probably... Uh, um, slightly fantastical to assume that Western society is going to, you know, completely divorce itself from energy use of any kind. Um, uh, I, I think there is a promise of actually um, pretty good, uh, you know, reliable, large-scale sources of clean energy. Um, and, you know, we, we've, we've become a sh used to, to, you know, burning stuff to get, to get fuel, um, and that... Uh, going up into the atmosphere in some ways. But actually, there's an opportunity right now to rethink that entirely and actually think that actually we can produce a, a, a very large amount of energy in a clean way. We won't be able to produce an infinite amount of energy, like we're not going to put solar panels over all of Australia. Um, that would have profound impacts on the ecosystem as well, um, uh, not to mention, you know, where we live. Um, but but I, think, I, I think there's nothing wrong with having energy. Energy is good. Um, we just don't, now that we know that the energy that we've been using has generally been very bad for the, the world's climate, um, we need to move off into cleaner forms of energy. We do need to think about whether we need to use as much energy as we do. I think it's always good to re reflect on that. You know, am I using the resources that I have wisely um, and in the best way I can, given that other people might need those resources more than me? So I think that's a good thing to think about. Yeah, that's really great. As we uh, head into our final few minutes, I just wanted to get both of your final thoughts on the topic, uh, but there's also a question here uh, for both of you. Firstly, Matt, do you have any recommendations as to where we can go and get re reliable, up-to-date information on climate change? And yourself, Mikey, is there any helpful environmental theology as well? Yeah, so look, the one resource I would go to, if you've still got questions about climate change especially, you're a little bit sceptical still, I would go, I would Google sceptical science, uh, scepticalscience.com. Uh, it's a great resource of um, uh, layperson's understanding of uh, a lot of the um, objections to climate science and, and so everything from simple to uh, advanced answers to a lot of those concerns. Um, it's a tremendous resource. There, you can go to the front page of scepticalscience.com and there's a, you know, begin here button and you can start your journey um, into climate change. That's where I'd go to to start with. Um, actually, I, I haven't read deeply in the theological e environmentalist sort of literature and, and so I can't sort of give the strong recommends on that. I guess one of the things that I would want to convey to you rather than needing to read specialised books is to actually go back and read the Bible. If this is a Christian asking the question or even not, go back and read the Bible yourself with this sort of stuff in mind and let God's word speak to you afresh and be confident that he has. Because I know he has to me. 
So I haven't needed some other environmentalist theologian to tell me something. I, I've kept coming back to God's word and seeing how it speaks to these issues today, you know, illuminated by his, his spirit. There's a, a weird movie called Noah by Darren Aronofsky that portrays two views of the image of God. There's Tubal Cain's view of the image of God, which is God made man in his image, let him rule, and he's killing the earth. And then there's Noah and his family's view of the image of God. God made man and woman in his image, let him rule and care and tend and nurture. And that's just a great example of how the Bible handled and understood rightly actually speaks. It can be twisted, but can also speak really well on these things. So um, I certainly can testify to the fact that, that God's word is, is a... Is a a fountain of great stuff uh, to come back and look at afresh. Well, thank you so much, Matt and Mikey. This has been an outstanding, dis outstanding discussion on climate change and hope. So as they head off, let's give them a big round of applause. <laughs> so as we head into our final few minutes, and before I hand over back to Russ Matthews, I would like to draw your attention to the bottom of the events page or the inside of your events booklet, because it's here that you will be able to give feedback. Because, obviously, when you give feedback, we can make these events even better. So if you can do that, take a couple of minutes, about two minutes, because our goal really is to keep this conversation going. We want to hear from you and we want to encourage more discussion about all the topics that you've heard tonight. And if you've enjoyed this topic and you want to find out more, you can go to the back of the booklet or the bottom of the events page and you can actually see the link for the podcasts, The Bigger Questions with Rob Martin. And there you'll find ones on things like what is the right relationship with the environment and also where can we find hope in a coronavirus world. And lastly, the next event topic that's coming up is called Refocusing on Care, Bringing a Bit of Humanity Back to the Workplace, which is happening on May 27th. So thank you all for being here tonight at the first EDGE event of 2021. Also, thank you to Hype TV, the University of Tasmania, Mikey Lynch and Matt King. We want to just give you a huge thank you for making this event possible. I'm Ella Hickey from The EDGE. We hope you enjoyed this night. And now I'll turn things back over to Russ Matthews. Well, thank you for being a part of The Edge tonight. We want to thank our speakers, the moderator, City Bible Forum, team members, and the crew behind the scenes. Thank you for being a part of this evening. We want to thank you for making this whole event possible. We hope you enjoyed the night. We will be sending you an email to ask you for your feedback for tonight's event. Your feedback is exceptionally valuable to us and it helps to make these events even better in the future. Along with the feedback form, you will receive resources that will complement this evening's discussion and also a way for us to share with you about future events from The Edge and City Bible Forum. Our goal is to keep the conversation going. We want to hear from you and encourage more discussions on many of the topics brought up to tonight. Thank you again for being part of The Edge. I am Russ Matthews from City Bible Forum. We hope you enjoyed tonight's event, and we look forward to seeing you in the future as we take the next topic to The Edge. <laughs>